Twice a year, I clean out my closet. I mean twice a year, when the weather starts to change, I change out my seasonal clothing. How much cleaning actually happens is inconsistent. In the spring, I might vacuum. So really, once a year, I clean my closet. And twice a year, I switch out my clothes. <clears throat> and it never fails that as soon as I pull out my winter clothes and put them in the closet, it immediately heats up, and I'm sweating in my sweaters. The same is true in reverse in the spring. So when I make my seasonal switch out of clothing, I go through everything. I've gotten pretty good at bagging up the clothes I no longer like and taking them to the thrift store. I watched Marie Kondo on Netflix. I know that if my pants no longer bring me joy, then I should pass them along, and I do. For me, it's harder to get rid of shoes, but I do try. And you know what? I always feel great after I clean out my closet. I do. Organizational expert Jennifer Paris provides six reasons why cleaning out your closet is legit life-changing. She says, one, you'll save money because you'll remember what you have and not duplicate it with fresh purchases. Two, you'll be less stressed. You'll clear out the clutter and be able to quickly find what you want. Three, you'll make room for what matters. There will be ample space for what you really need. Four, if you live with someone else, it will improve your relationship, she says. I don't know about that one. <laughs> I mean, Lisa is rarely in my closet, <laughs> and I don't think it matters to her what is in there, but I imagine if I am less stressed because I have a clean closet, it can't hurt. Five, you'll realize you're in a rut, that you're wearing the same five things over and over, and forget all the other clothes that at some point you liked enough to buy. And six, your clean closet will carry over to the other parts of your house. You'll realize you kind of like it when things are less cluttered. Essentially, by physically clearing out our old items, which no longer serve us, we lessen our emotional load. I think the same is true of our spiritual selves. The work of transformation in hearts and lives often begins with a making of space a clearing out of the former things. Sometimes we do this with joy and excitement. Sometimes we do this of necessity. There's no room for anything else to fit. We have to toss some things out just to breathe. We do this all year long at this church. We pull out beliefs and traditions of the Christian faith. We examine them to see if they still fit and if they don't, then we try to lovingly let them go to make room for something else. Our Advent theme is creating space. So over the next few Sundays of Advent, we'll pull out the Christmas story and try it on for size. We'll explore which parts of the story bring us joy and which need some updating. And in place of organizational experts that guide us through cleaning our closets, we'll largely look to the wisdom of three insightful theologians. Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crossan wrote a book called The First Christmas, What the Gospels Really Teach About Jesus' Birth. And third is a theologian who's a lot closer to home, bright professor Dr. Will Gaffney. Dr. Gaffney recently published a woman's lectionary for the whole church. In fact, this is the first Sunday of the liturgical year. Happy liturgical new year, by the way. <laughs> and I will be using Dr. Gaffney's lectionary often in the coming year. A note for church nerds who care about such things, the revised common lectionary is divided into three years, year A, B, and C. Dr. Gaffney has added a fourth year, which she calls year W. What would it look like if women built a lectionary focusing on women's stories in the Bible? Well, thanks to Dr. Gaffney, it looks like year W, and it will be our roadmap over the next year. 
For today, the Year W lectionary gospel text is from Luke, the story of the angel Gabriel appearing to Mary. Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town of Galilee, Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the name of the virgin was Mary. And the angel came to Mary and said, Rejoice, favored one, the Most High God is with you. Now she was troubled by the angel's words and pondered what sort of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Fear not, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Sovereign God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his sovereignty there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be? since I have not known a man intimately. The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit, she will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the one born will be called Holy. He will be called Son of God. And now, Elizabeth, your kinswoman, has even conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month for she who was called barren for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the woman slave of God. Let it be with me according to your word. And the angel left her. For most church folks, this ancient story is familiar. It's often called the Annunciation, when the angel Gabriel appears to announce the coming of Jesus. We've just read from Luke, but it also is found in Matthew. It's interesting to note some pretty distinct differences in the two accounts. In Luke, the angel Gabriel comes to Nazareth to deliver the exciting news. In Matthew, Gabriel shows up in Bethlehem. They're about 100 miles apart, but whatever. Second, in Luke, as we've just read, the angel comes to Mary. In Matthew, Gabriel appears to Joseph. Think about that for a minute. Of the countless paintings of the Annunciation, have you ever seen one of the angel Gabriel coming to Joseph? (laughs) It is from Matthew's imagination that Gabriel comes to Joseph. And we get the whole bit about Joseph planning to quietly dismiss Mary due to her presumed adultery. And Gabriel, the angel, says, oh, no, no, don't do that. The child she conceived is from the Holy Spirit. Joseph says, okay. Then Matthew says, Joseph took Mary as his wife, and he did not have sex with her until after Jesus was born. In Luke, the problem of possible adultery is never raised. Luke never says anything about how Joseph finds out or reacts. There's no hint anywhere in Luke that Joseph had a problem with Mary's pregnancy. In Luke, the angel appears to Mary. Maybe she tells Joseph the news and he believes her. My question, of course, is not about history, but about Matthew's intention as parable. Why Matthew chose to include that element in his story. In any event, Both Matthew and Luke agree that Mary was an engaged virgin when she conceived Jesus. And both agree that her pregnancy was not from Joseph, but from the Holy Spirit, that is, the Spirit of God. In the Hebrew Scriptures, there are several stories of surprising pregnancies when the women were either too old or had thought that they couldn't have children. Abraham laughed. He fell on the floor laughing when he learned that his wife Sarah was to have a child because she was 90 years old. Can you imagine? (laughs) 
A few weeks ago, we heard about Hannah, who desperately wanted a child, but she couldn't conceive until Yahweh, quote, opened her womb. She became an unlikely mother to Samuel. There are more stories in the Bible of miraculous pregnancies, including the story noted in our passage today of, of Elizabeth in her old age becoming pregnant with her son, John the Baptist. To this list of women in the Hebrew scriptures who conceived miraculously, Luke and Matthew come along with something new. Not only was Mary's pregnancy unlikely, it was impossible because she was a virgin. Mary is the only one who is said to have been a virgin. Now, why did Luke and Matthew tell the story this way? Well, think of it as a way of upping the ante, so to speak. It's a way to exalt the divine conception of Jesus over all others. Jesus' divine conception, born of a virgin, make him different than and greater than all the others. And that includes the others from the Hebrew scriptures as well as in the Roman tradition where Augustus, the emperor, was also said to be divinely conceived. Mary, the virgin who conceived, was a way of exalting Jesus over Augustine himself. The virgin birth, by the way, by this way of understanding, excuse me, is a metaphor, a sort of literary device to show the truth of how special Jesus would be. Did ancient people believe that Mary was a virgin when she conceived Jesus? Did they believe it literally or metaphorically? Well, to speculate about that, we must remember that they were almost two millennia away from knowing that conception involves an ovum and sperm. I mean, 2,000 years ago, they got the idea that a male and female were necessary for conception and that it had something to do with fluid, but that's about it. And also, conception by human-divine interaction was a cultural given. There are stories outside of the Christian tradition of conception between a god and a human. So the general possibility of divine conception was presumed, but the exact mechanics were fuzzy and likely just not that important to them. So what do you think of this part of the Christmas story, the Annunciation? As we're cleaning out our Advent closets, what should we notice? What should we keep? What should we discard? Well, that's of course up to you. For me, one thing to discard is the assumption that the Gospels are history. And honestly, I discarded that a long time ago. <laughs> this story lends a good example of why. The two versions are factually very different. One says Gabriel came to Mary, the other Joseph. One said it happened in Bethlehem, the other Nazareth. There are more differences, but you get the idea. The Gospels are not newspaper accounts of the conception of Jesus or the life of Jesus. Another thing to discard, well, for me, Mary was not a virgin when she conceived Jesus. Mary got pregnant the old-fashioned way. And if we discard the expectation that the Gospels are, are history to be literally understood, then we're able to make room for a greater than literal meaning a richer understanding of these stories. We'll talk about that more in the coming weeks, but let me close with one quick example. In traditional readings of all of the biblical stories of women with unlikely or miraculous conceptions, the women are all but reduced to the biological function of pregnancy, a function not all women have or choose to perform. Yet even in that very reductionist view of women in these stories, women are more than incubators. Women are divine conversation partners. Women are theologians. Women are evidence that God chooses those at the bottom of the hierarchies. In biblical stories, God chooses women 
foreigners, the enslaved. God is concerned with the least powerful, the most vulnerable people. Jesus in his life as the incarnation of God will continue to identify with those on the margins and those excluded by the margins. And if we say we love God, then we should too. That is an understanding worth hanging on to. Next week, we'll read more of Mary's story as recounted in Luke's gospel, and we'll continue cleaning out our Advent closets, going deeper into the Christmas stories of our faith and sorting through what to keep, what to update, and what to lovingly let go of.